The Limits of Change, The Impact of the New Deals. Lecture Terms The New Deal and Minorities Focus Question How did the New Deal affect women and other minorities? The New Deal and Women Roosevelt conceived of the Second New Deal's assistance to broad groups of needy Americans the unemployed, the elderly, and the dependent. He saw this as a right of citizenship, not a special privilege. But the realities of inherited ideas about gender and black disenfranchisement in the South powerfully affected legislation. The New Deal affected different groups of Americans in very different ways as a result. The New Deal incorporated women into government more than any other previous administration. A number of talented women, such as Secretary of Labor Frances Perkins, advised the President and affected policy. The best known was Eleanor Roosevelt, who became the first modern First Lady, using her position for the reform in civil rights, labor laws, and work relief. But organized feminism was absent in the 1930s. The Depression actually provoked calls for women to leave the labor market in order to open up jobs for unemployed men. The federal government enacted laws that led to the dismissal of female government employees. And many private employers denied jobs to married women altogether. Even the CIO, which organized female workers, adhered to the notion that women should be supported by men. The ideal of the male-headed household powerfully shaped social policy. Because paying taxes on wages made one eligible for the most generous social security programs, old age pensions and unemployment insurance. They did not cover most women because they did not work outside the home. The program excluded three million mostly female domestic workers. The Limits of Change Although Roosevelt strove to portray the federal government as representing all people in America, the power of, quote, the solid South molded the New Deal welfare state into an entitlement of white Americans. With black disenfranchisement, Democrats in the South controlled politics. Southern Democratic members of Congress were elected again and again by tiny white electorates. Because committee chairmanships rested on seniority, once the Democrats took control of Congress in 1933, Southerners took the key leadership positions because they had been there the longest. Roosevelt believed he could not challenge the Southern Democrats if he wanted New Deal laws passed. Southern Democrats excluded from Social Security agricultural and domestic workers the largest categories of black employment. Only black organizations and the left pushed for truly universal social insurance. Congressman Ernest Lundeen in Minnesota in 1935 had introduced a bill to create a federal system of old age, unemployment, and health benefits for all wage workers. And he also supported for female heads of household, households with dependents to have aid. But ultimately it was replaced by the Social Security bill. Because of this quote, Southern veto. Most black workers were limited to the least generous and most vulnerable parts of the new welfare state. Direct public assistance programs were ostensibly open to all poor seniors and families with dependent children who demonstrated financial need. But benefits were set low and eligibility was determined by state and local officials who had broad authority on who would get these benefits. In the South, 
this translated into widespread discrimination. Because recipients of direct assistance did not pay Social Security taxes, they soon bore a stigma of dependency on government handouts, which became known simply as, quote, welfare. The stigma of welfare intensified until pressure for reform led the federal government to abolish its responsibility for welfare. But that would not be until 1996 during Bill Clinton's administration, 60 years after. The New Deal affected Native Americans in a different way as well. The Depression and the New Deal had contradictory impacts on the nation's racial minorities. The Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier, launched, quote, an Indian, Indian New Deal, ending the policy of coerced assimilation and granting unprecedented cultural autonomy to the different tribes. He replaced boarding schools with reservation schools. He increased spending on Indian health. He also ended the policy implemented since the Dawes Act of dividing Indian lands into small individual family plots and selling off the rest. Federal officials now recognize the right of Indians to govern their own communities, except in areas covered by federal law. Through the New Deal, was the, this was the most radical shift in Indian policy in American history. However, it barely improved living conditions on extremely poor reservations. The Depression devastated Mexican Americans as well, 400,000 of whom returned to Mexico when demand for their labor declined. Some were coerced into moving by authorities in the Southwest. Perhaps 200,000 Mexican American children were born in the United States and were thus citizens, but they were all pressured to move to Mexico to make room for those entering the West looking for work. Those who did stay worked in desperate conditions on large corporate farms in the Southwest picking fruit and vegetables. The Wagner Act and Social Security Act did not apply to agricultural workers, and when they tried to unionize, they were brutally suppressed. Mexican-American leaders tried to develop a strategy to claim rights as white Americans, but they also sought support from the Mexican government and promoted a mystical sense of pride and identification with Mexican heritage, later given the name La Raza. Federal discrimination. Always, quote, last hired and first fired, African Americans suffered the most in the Depression. Blacks who kept their jobs now competed with unemployed whites. Facing an unemployment rate twice that of whites, blacks benefited less from direct government relief and public works projects. The Depression forced blacks to make economic survival their primary demand. Even W.E.B. Du Bois surrendered his hopes for racial, racial integration, and he urged blacks to think of themselves as, quote, a nation within a nation. He urged blacks to build an independent, cooperative economy within their own communities and take control of separate schools. While Roosevelt seemed little interested in race relations or civil rights, he appointed Mary McLeod Bethune, a well-known black educator, as his advisor on minority affairs, and other blacks also took key positions. Key members of his administration, including his wife, Eleanor, and the Secretary of the Interior, Harold Ikes, criticized segregation. They also criticized disenfranchisement and lynching that was still going on in parts of the nation. Blacks generally supported the New Deal and started voting for the Democratic Party 
in the 1930s as a result. This marked a major shifting away from their traditional support for Republicans since emancipation during the Civil War. Their hopes for broader changes were stymied by white Southern Democrats' influence in that party, however. Federal housing policy powerfully reinforced residential segregations as well. This also showed the limitations of New Deal freedoms. Local officials implemented national housing policies in ways that reinforced existing racial discrimination. Nearly all municipalities in both the North and the South, South insisted that housing sponsored by the federal government be racially segregated. The Federal Housing Administration also issued mortgages that contained clauses barring future sale to non-whites. Federal employment practices also engaged in racial discrimination. In the federal government, few blacks held skilled or professional positions. And in the South, many New Deal construction projects refused to hire blacks as workers. The New Deal's modernization of Southern agriculture led large landowners to displaced tenant farmers, many of whom were black. Only with the Great Society programs of the 1960s was the welfare state extended in ways to fully incorporate black Americans. A new conception of America. Focus question. How did the popular front influence American culture in the 1930s? American Communism If the New Deal did not end second-class citizenship for blacks, the 1930s saw the inclusion of other groups into mainstream American life. With Catholics and Jews in prominent posts in Roosevelt's administration and new immigrant voters forming a base of the Democratic Party, the New Deal made ethnic pluralism central to American politics. The election of Fiorello LaGuardia, an Italian-American, as New York's mayor in 1933 represented the growing power of ethnic working class voters. This is whom LaGuardia Airport is now named after. These ethnic groups experienced growing cultural assimilation as immigration from Europe virtually halted and movies, chain stores, and mass advertising penetrated immigrant enclaves all around. Unlike the coercive Americanization of the past, however, this Americanization incorporated ethnic identity and married it to American political ideals. In the mid-1930s, for the first time in U.S. history, the left, which included socialists, communists, labor radicals, and many New Deal liberals strongly influenced American politics and culture. The CIO and the Communist Party in particular became the center of a social and intellectual impulse that helped reshape the boundaries of American freedom. The Communist Party grew from a very small and isolated organization into a mass organization during this time. Although it never had more than 100,000 members at any one time in the 1930s, several times that number passed through its ranks. The communist dedication to socialism appealed to a widespread belief that the Depression showed that capitalism as a whole had failed. But more important was the party's constant activity on behalf of the unemployed, workers and unions, and their support of civil rights for African Americans. At the height of the popular front, when the communists sought to ally themselves with socialists and New Deal liberals in movements for reform rather than revolution, the Communist Party was seen as respectable. Even though tied to Stalinist Russia, 
Communist Party ironically contributed to New Deal liberalism, expansion of freedom, and its pluralist conception of America. A New Conception of America The Popular Front vision of American society greatly influenced American culture through theater, film, and dance. Its broadly left-wing ethos defined social and economic radicalism. It did not support status quo as true Americanism. Ethnic and racial diversity, unionism and social citizenship were what made America great, not the pursuit of wealth, the Popular Front argued. The American, quote, people, seen by many intellectuals in the 1920s as fundamentalist and crassly commercial, were now proclaimed embodiments of democratic virtue. Artists and writers in the 1930s crafted socially meaningful work that depicted daily life for ordinary farmers and urban workers. They also produced art about migrant workers and sharecroppers and that created by the people, such as folk music and black spirituals, were held to express genuine Americanism. The Democratic Party, despite its new northern black and ethnic base of support, did not embrace ethno-cultural issues, however. But the Popular Front insisted that the nation's greatest greatness lay in its diversity, its tolerance, and a rejection of ethnic prejudice and class privilege. The CIO promoted and often embodied this idea of ethnic and racial inclusivity. It adopted cultural pluralism and welcomed groups previously excluded from the labor movement, such as blacks and Mexican Americans. Yet, while popular front culture celebrated the promise of America, it did not ignore its tragedies and troubles, such as racial discrimination and the dispossession of Native Americans. Challenging the color line, popular front culture strongly condemned racism as incompatible with Americanism. Compared to New Deal liberalism's tepid stance on issues of race and civil rights, while Jewish and Catholic groups promoted ethnic and religious tolerance, the Communist Party was the only mostly white organization of the era to prioritize combating racism. The Communists even found support in the conservative South, believe it or not. Communist groups mobilized popular support for black defendants victimized by a racist criminal justice system which made the Scottsboro case an international cause. Nine young black men in Scottsboro, Alabama were arrested in 1931 for allegedly raping two white women. Although one of the two accusers recanted, the men were put on trial and convicted three different times. The Supreme Court rejected the first two verdicts and created legal principles that greatly expanded civil liberties, that defendants have a constitutional right to effective legal representation, and that blacks cannot be systematically excluded from juries. But the Supreme Court approved the third conviction, and five of the men went to prison for more than a decade. White workers' resistance did not keep the CIO from welcoming black members and supporting anti-lynching laws and voting rights for Southern blacks. For the first time, the CIO brought large numbers of blacks into the labor movement, even after exclusion had made them hostile to unions for so many years. Popular front culture also supported civil liberties especially the right of workers to organize unions. Pro-union workers faced local laws restricting free speech 
and repression by private and public police. Public concern about violence directed at southern tenant farmers and northern industrial workers made discussions of labor rights discussions over civil liberties. In 1936, a Senate committee led by Robert M. La Follette exposed the harsh methods employers used to fight unionization. This included spies and private police hired by these employers. Critics argued that America's workplaces resembled European di dictatorships. Workers' militancy also showcased that the free speech of groups, not just individuals, could also be violated. And the federal government responded by emphasizing the importance of civil liberties. The Supreme Court abandoned liberty of contract for a definition of American freedom based on civil liberties and allowed free speech for communists, labor picketing, and initiated the repeal of numerous state laws that inhibited freedom of expression. Yet, other groups also tried to restrict free speech. In 1938, the U.S. House of Representatives created an, quote, Un-American Activities Committee to ferret out disloyalty and, quote, un-American behavior and speech. Two years later, Congress passed the Smith Act which made it a crime to, quote, teach, advocate, or encourage the overthrow of a government. Similar committees were established at the state level and used to intimidate communists and others who were on the left wing. The end of the New Deal. By 1940, the New Deal was ending. More and more Southern Democrats opposed Roosevelt's policies. Roosevelt exposed the poverty and lack of economic development in the South, and a new generation of homegrown Southern radicals, Southern New Dealers, black activists, labor leaders, communists, and a few elected officials, were organizing for unions, unemployment relief, and racial justice. Instead of simply shaping New Deal measures to accommodate their racial and economic preferences, Southern Democrats who feared that federal intervention in the region would lead to more unions and racial conflict, started instead to oppose Roosevelt's proposals altogether. In 1938, FDR, in response, appealed to Southern voters to support more progressive, pro-New Deal, Southern Democratic candidates in the congressional elections. Instead, the South's small electorate resisted and re-elected the incumbents. In the North, court packing and the rise of the CIO led middle-class voters to go toward the Republicans. The Republicans gained a significant number of seats in Congress, and a stalemate in Congress followed. Congress started to eliminate many popular New Deal programs and Roosevelt turned his administration's attention toward Europe and impending war. The New Deal seems limited given the enormous catastrophe it confronted. Compared to European welfare states, Social Security was confined to fewer functions and not as funded. The New Deal had not improved race or gender relations, but actually worsened them in many ways. But the New Deal accomplished many things, most importantly, making the federal government an active force in regulating and shaping economic life in the United States. The New Deal also restored Americans' faith in democracy. It reconfigured the American Party and electoral politics, and it reinvigorated ideas of freedom to include a more diverse version of the American people. But even the New Deal could not undo the Depression. That finally came to an end only by the mass employment that was created by World War II.